Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Off White Coat Podcast. I apologize. It has been a minute. It has been, I'm currently going through interview season, and it has been uh, a doozy. It's a lot, of, a lot of talking, and I haven't been able to talk to you. For that, I apologize. But you know what? I'm going to bring you something special today, because today I got a great guest. All right, everybody. Today, I have a special one. I have one of my great friends from St. George's University, the champion of the Saint jo- uh, of the basketball team, intramural basketball. I've got a man so confident with his medical knowledge and his heritage, he was willing to drink tequila before a test. A master of nature. Once, I even watched him grab a, tur- a sea turtle in the ocean. I got with I, I'm here today with Dr. Jesus Davalos. How's it going, buddy? It's going good. What an intro. I know, dude. Well, it's all true, too. It's all true. <laughs> Man, this the sea turtle thing blew my mind. Gosh, good times. Good times. Yeah. And I didn't even mention the fact that he grabbed the turtle and it literally pooped right there in the ocean. Like, oh, yeah. It scared oh, yeah. the crap it's out of <laughs> good stuff good stuff this is the yellowstone edition so this yeah. man he is uh he's finally gone back he he left his island roots or he he left his island life and now he's back in his hometown he got his dream residency now he is a internal medicine uh intern yep. at the good old texas tech yeah, it was, you know, it was kind of hard. It was kind of hard coming back, you know, sunny and 85 every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, got my toes in the water. <sighs> back to boots. Sure it's, I'm sure it's bad uh, being back in, um, I, I'm sure it's just way worse than Baltimore. Oh, man. Baltimore was Baltimore. My respect. <laughs> Tip my hat to Baltimore. Yes, dude. <laughs> hey, well, how has it been? How has it been being back at home and... It's been good. You know, uh, residency is definitely a big adjustment. Uh, medical school does its best to prepare you, but you know, it, regardless, you get hit in the mouth. Uh, and so being home really softens that blow. You know, I have my parents an hour away. Uh, there's days where when I get off early and it's just kind of one of those tough ones, I'll just mm-hmm. drive home when I get off work, have dinner with my mom, whatever she cooked, and then I just drive on back. Dude, so wait, how far away is it from your home? Ha- from your home, it's like uh, a little under a hundred miles. So you okay, know. I don't want you to oust your your mom's house. Your mom's house, I know. Yeah. I don't know. So it's 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 like an hour and fifteen minutes. You know. Okay, so dude. It. Yes, man, and he's he's already back in the Texas life. Got the cowboy hat. Got the. Oh, first off, that was a flask. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> you know, you touched on the heritage roots. Dude, it's the truth though, man. He uh he's taught me a lot. Man taught me how to make salsa too. Salsa, so yeah. he's a he's a man of many talents. Um well give us a little rundown, like how uh like what are some of the challenges that you've seen in this first year? Oh man, challenges that you see your first year, there's a lot of them. Uh, you know, one of the things they don't really, you know, they t- they teach you everything you should know. But one of the challenges is using an analogy is when to pull the trigger. You know, it's like the Texas saying, baby, it's a saying, right? So you get a patient and, you know, you're left alone. You have people you could ask. But at the end of the day, you know, you might have to go and evaluate a patient on your own, put in admission orders or get called to go see a patient, you know, in the middle of the night. And it's like it's it's really easy to start questioning what you should do in that moment you know mm-hmm. so if it was a question stem you would know like oh easy easy start this yeah but when you're there it's like you know taking that extra little time and the most difficult thing is to just pull the trick you know mm-hmm. you do that. oh yeah it's i mean it's there's no multiple choice out here in the real world so it can be it can be tough dude okay. yeah option a is your ekg B is the chest x-ray you ordered. C is the ABG. D are your O2 saturations. You know, work of breathing. And 
make it, make the decision. And you're in internal medicine, so it's usually E, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, uh, dude. Well, um, has there any has there any been ugh, has there been any like great moments that you've had so far? Great, you say? Yeah, like any. What are some of the good things about the progression from medical school to that intern life? You no, know, besides progress- the paycheck. Yeah, the paycheck is nice. <laughs> Those start coming in, you start feeling good. You know, uh, great things. It's hard to call anything great. I think the greatest thing you could do as an intern is not have your attending or a senior add to your work. Mm. You know, like I think those are the things you should strive for. Keep it realistic uh, because, you know, it's really hard to have those. Oh, I'm going to save a patient's life moments as an intern. uh, You do learn a lot. You do get an opportunity to participate. But the best thing you could do is, you know, not be the reason something was missed that led to an eventual crash, mm-hmm. right? Do that by making sure nobody has to add to your workload. Yeah, that's smart. What uh, is there a lot of oversight um, at your residency? No, no, that's a big misconception. That's, that's a that's a good thing and a bad dude and a scary <laughs> thing. This is the wild west, you know. <laughs> Outlaw medicine over here. So, for instance. Uh, it doesn't matter what rotation you're in. It depends what, you know, the rotations, but, uh, you know, some of these attendings, they just really have a lot of faith in the people they, you know, match with. Mm-hmm. They chose me for a reason. You were in their top, whatever, for a reason. And so it shows, cause when you get here, for instance, you know, my first rotation was in the MICU, which was, you know, getting thrown to the wolves right off the bat. But then shortly after, you're, you know, you're on floor rotations. The attendings, they show up at 10. And they mm-hmm. just kind of say, all right, what have we been doing with the patient? And this is where all morning you were there. You were evaluating the patient, putting in, you know, orders for a workup. And that's, that's what I mean. If the attending gets there, you know, he doesn't want to sit there and tell you, well, why aren't we considering this? Why mm-hmm. aren't we considering that? And they won't stop you from working things up you're considering. If anything, they say, oh, that's interesting. Well, we'll see what happens. Mm. So the oversight, you know, there is some. They, you have some. But yeah. it's it's really nice that they just let you take what you know. And that's why I tell you, if you learn to, if, if you learn to make pulling the trigger seamless, you'll start making mistakes or taking steps, and then they can direct those steps. Mm-hmm. Okay don't pull the trigger you don't take a step and there's no movement they don't know which way you they don't know which direction you're going and how to fix it yeah yeah um are you still loving do you are you still feeling the the critical care life oh 100 percent. oh yeah that's the best you know yeah. being, a, being an internist you know i'm going to be brutally honest and i'm sorry for those who want to be in internal medicine i'm allowed to say this because i'm an internist but yeah. uh it's rough man. it's rough it's rough because, you know, you, you'll admit patients and I was did a rotation in the ED. And uh, so I have to be an ER physician for a day, you know, for a mm-hmm. rotation. And sometimes surgery ortho will come down and be like, oh yeah, we'll see the patient admit to medicine. And you're just like, <laughs> yeah. you're like, I'm turning on my own people, dude. Okay, admit to medicine. What do you need us to do? His leg is broken, you know? Uh-huh. And then it's like, you know, it does leave you just like, all right, you know, you, you're a little young yet to start saying no. Mm. And so when you get those patients and you have to just kind of babysit them and then ortho got busy and they say, oh, no, nope, we'll do, we'll plan for tomorrow and we'll plan for tomorrow. And there you are just monitoring blood sugars. It's a little frustrating. And in ICU, you don't get that, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just tube them. You just, yeah. yeah. And you you just silence, baby. In ICU, you call a specialist in. You call a specialty in and they, you know, thank you for the recommendation. <laughs> that's it. The recommendations. And I like that. That's awesome. Do you have to, um, like, are you already starting the, like, if you're going to go into the critical care fellowship or palm crit, like, have you already started the steps for that? Or will that come in like your second, third year? You know, there isn't a time where they start, you know, you should just make sure you've started 
Uh, okay. And, and you do that by just making sure you know what's going to happen, like what they need and what the application process is like. So, for instance, people want to know you did research. Um, people want to know you have case reports that you're published. And so if you know you want to do something, uh, it's best that no one has to tell you when to start. And so okay. one of the things we do here is we make, you know, I see what we call critical care mafias. And so if you want to do critical care and there's four of us who want to do critical care in our intern group, uh, well, I'll, you know, I will, or whoever gets an interesting case, they'll do a case report and they'll throw everyone's name on there. So it just takes, so if we all do one, you get four. Hmm. Okay. So just, that's the answer. So you just go ahead and yeah, let them know, I guess, early. Exactly. Don't look at it as cutthroat, you know. There's plenty of room at the table. Uh, be inclusive. And the more you are like that, the happier people are to help you as well. Mm -hmm. They're ha they'll happily throw you on anything and everything. They get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So for anybody that doesn't know, St. George's University is in Grenada. So were there any uh, issues being an uh, international medical school student uh, or going be an international medical graduate, actually? And were there any issues going into um, your intern year? You know, I think uh, if I could go back, I would worry a lot less, you know, for anybody from Grenada, St. George is listening to this. Uh, I think that's just something we go in kind of traumatized and it's people talking without actual evidence and statistics showing how difficult it really is. Right. They just keep mm -hmm. saying all the all the things they say are subjective. Right. They say, oh, it's difficult. They choose this. They choose that. But there's no evidence supporting. Right. Yeah. Uh, especially when you can go to any given hospital and find IMGs there. Um, so if you are just diligent about what you do and you're handling your business, trust me, you're going to be fine. Because, I mean, just in my program alone, I think half of my intern class are IMGs. And on top of that, the majority of the IMGs, I think me and myself, no, myself and 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 uh, who I matched with, who I couples matched with, Sierra, uh, we're the only two U.S. IMGs. So that means the rest of them are legitimate IMGs who were doctors in their own country first, and then came over here. I will say that has been very challenging, you know. So mm -hmm. one of my co, you know, one of my co-interns uh, was a surgeon in Guatemala. You know, another one what a switch up cardiology in India, you know, another one did a year of critical care before coming here. So you got to really perform. I will say that, that if you're going to a program who takes IMGs and you realize that those IMGs are not U.S. IMGs, you know, you're going oh, yeah. to you're gonna put in work to keep up. I did a I did a rotation, a surgery rotation. <clears throat> and one of the trauma surgeons that he was like a third year resident. Mm -hmm. He was going into trauma surgery. He had already been a trauma surgeon in Puerto Rico for like six years before coming and doing this residency. So when it came time, when he had an upper level talking to him, yeah, he was like, oh, I mean, I would probably just do it this way. And the attending looks at him and goes, we're going to do that. Yeah. You know, like there are. Uh, so, yeah, it's like that's very uh, that's a good point because you got to bring your A game with some of these IMGs. Is there any. Uh, have you seen any benefits, I guess, besides playing up to the competition, but any benefits of being that international medical graduate? Yes. Benefits was, is I was, I was prepared for the work, man. You know, mm -hmm. you know more than anybody. We'd be up early, have to go to class, be up late, like just the work we had to do, not only for school, because we were an IMGC and they required us to do just a ton of stuff. A bunch of arbitrary stuff. Yeah, we had to do that all while assimilating to a new culture, learning how to live life without some of the things we need or are used to having on a daily basis. Friends, family, a car, a grocery store, a Costco, internet on the regular that doesn't interrupt. Like think about the things we had to overcome. And so when I actually started residency, kind of nice it's easy so that yeah. has been something i have benefited from right aside mm -hmm. from having to play up to the competition is 
I'm playing up to the competition to match their knowledge. But they're struggling to get out of bed when I get out of bed. Oh, yeah, that drives there, baby. Exactly. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, not only do you have that, because I've noticed that even about, you know, my situation too, but you got to live on an island for two years. So well, it's like we have all these great stories, and trust me, we won't go into too many of them, but we got plenty of uh, history, and uh, we ran all up and down that island, and it is, uh, so we have all that time. You I mean, catching sea turtles and stuff, and then you you still get to come back and you've got, you know, all the tools to make it. Yep. So it, yeah. And yeah. it's something to, you said too, about uh, people talking about things that they really, you know, there was no actual evidence or data. Like a lot of people told me, you know, for emergency medicine, they, there's essentially no way as an IMG, like you gotta be a, at the top and you're going to have limited amount of interviews. And I haven't seen that at all. No, I haven't um, seen it. No, nope. Joel Collins, yeah. shameless, shameless plug here. Joel yeah. Collins, look him up. He's very helpful, very informational uh, about the process of going to the Caribbean and coming here. He got um, emergency medicine, and he's yeah. one of the ones who'll tell you, "Hey, it's nearly impossible. You should probably play it safe. Go internal medicine or family." Uh, and you know, he's living proof. Yeah, the real Doctor Joel. Uh, anybody's looking yeah you know, he he actually mentioned you the other day did you, did you ever see that oh you don't even have yeah 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 i did see him. He about protein yeah he said something about the two protein <laughs> scoops exactly yeah oh yes dude um awesome yeah because so i uh am currently going through the interview process and everything and you managed to secure the residency of your dreams essentially because and when i tell you Everybody, I know we did uh, we did like a resident podcast previously. So if y'all want to go listen to that, go ahead. But when I he this was before he had matched. So he was manifesting this though since I mean the first two weeks of Grenada. You said, like, yeah. I really want to go here and I'm gonna I put you know new residency. Everyone hey. was working, everyone was wow, residency, the match. You never know. I always said like, oh no, I know. Yeah. I'll be back in Lubbock. Yeah. And you, Hey, and you did it. And that's, I mean, to one, when you have a goal, you know, you set your standards high enough to reach those goals. Uh, but for one, if I, you know, that's a, we'll get the, we'll, we'll sound in or add in the the clapping sounds, you know, baby, a little, <laughs> little crowd clapping. Cause it's just me and you here. Uh, but that, I mean, that's a testament to your own self. So you should feel proud of that. Um, yeah. Hey. And so do you have any, for any other people that are looking to manifest, yeah, do you have any uh, recommendations or tips or things like that for how you pull that off? Yes, uh, a, a very simple way. You know, the simplest way I could give it to you is make sure you knock on the door. You know, sending someone mail isn't enough, right? Because there's a lot more variables that have to come into play. They have to go. They have to check their mailbox. The, the letter you send has to reach them. There's nothing like walking up and knocking on the door to the program you want. Mm. And so with that being said, how do I knock on the door? Well, there are these things you could do that put your name on their desk, right? And that's you knocking on the door. You, you find the director and you send an email. Right. You send you send him a letter of, of intent, a letter of interest is what you can call it and say, hey. I don't know if you know, but I'm in your backyard. I'm from this area. Right. Because you have to realize that the application process is actually pretty random and it's kind of luck unless you make it calculated. Right. And what I mean by that is they get a pool of four to 5,000 applicants. And then they kind of, the computer kind of throws some things course, in it. Yeah. And it narrows it down to a window of, you know, a couple hundred. And then those are the ones they kind of filter through. So you could very easily not make it through that first filter, not because you're not qualified, but because it's random. So no, no, don't take offense, right? And I'm going to tell you straight up, I never got an interview 
from Texas Tech. The weeks were going by. And I didn't get an interview. Sweat, baby. Didn't get an interview. So you know what I did? I knocked and I said, hey, I'm from here. I went to undergrad. I want to go there. I want to do internal medicine. You know, this is where my family lives. These are my ties to the area. I have strong interest in your program. And then on top of that, once that put my name on their desk, then one day I'm, you know, I'm in California at the time doing rotations and I come home for uh, um, Thanksgiving. You know what I do? I drive an hour and I wander through the hospital asking for, you know, where Dr. Fi is. And I we found his office, stood outside of it until he showed up. And he's like, who the heck are these strangers? Introduce myself. I say, hey, we apply. We're interested. You know what happens? We get an interview. Hell yeah, dude. I got a little tingle down my spine right there. So you have to do the little things that, you know, who do you know? Who do you know they can give you a call? I know I hate to have to go down this route, right? It kind of, mm -hmm. you know, but you got to do what you got to do. You know, you, you, you got to determine how bad you want it. And uh, you got to get your application on their desk. Yeah, I think it's a it's like a little bit of self pride or something where you're like, oh, I think I want like I'm good enough, so you should recognize how good I like that I am good and I want to be there. But it's like you're saying it's a little bit of random, and so I actually took that uh, like a page out of that playbook for you uh, of your playbook because there were some programs, especially in the South, you know, there's not that many um, super IMG friendly. Yeah. Uh, program so you got to reach out and you never know like i've been in uh a couple of these interviews and like half of the reason that i got the interview was like the one today they just want to know why i went to hargrave like this military yeah. academy to play football they were had no idea why i was there and, and one guy lived right with the program director lived right beside it in the, this yeah. one red light town yeah and so you know if you can make your uh your application you know, very broad where you have all these kind of things. Uh, I mean, I think it just adds to it. And if you're willing to go out there and say, Hey, look, like I, we, me and you have a connection, you know, we've got something going on. I, I think that's all you can do. You you can, yeah. it doesn't mean any less for, of you for you to go ahead and put yourself out there. Yeah. And they and just in, say no. And you're doing them a favor, believe it or not, you're doing them a favor because the application process is actually very, uh, it's nerve wracking for them because it, you know, their ability to match applicants uh, depends on their decision making and they have to decipher, is this person really taking me seriously or is he playing games? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because if they rank applicants really high based on, you know, some of their accomplishments, and they misgauge the interest in the actual program, then they're going to miss out on people who really wanted to go there and they run the risk of not filling all their spots. Right? Yeah. So by you coming out of the woodworks and saying, hey, I'm in your backyard, right? You increase the probability of them getting an applicant. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I tell you this because you know, Dr. Banda, uh, was the director at a, a program down in Louisiana. I interviewed at. Uh, it was also one of my one of my top choices. And he actually is the one who told us how random it is. He said, it's random. We just get a list of names on our desks after the first filter. And so one other thing you learn from the application process is once you have the interview, they are no longer comparing your accomplishments. Oh, it's... for their program mm -hmm. you made it now it's just a matter of do i like this guy is he nice can he talk is he well spoken do we have anything in common see what i mean mm -hmm. so a lot of times you know some people don't even you know some programs don't even really care what scores are as long as you meet a minimum threshold which a lot of people do so if you could kind of raise your hand, draw their attention and get that interview, you really are doing them a favor. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, I can even attest to that because I mean, I am terrible at standardized test taking. I, I don't even have the highest of scores. Now, Jesus, you can't say that at all. He's a great test taker. So, <laughs> uh, but he's also, it, you, you play mind games even with the test. So uh, you're a hell of an applicant, but um, yeah, it's all about like who you are, what you're doing. I know that even um, this is like a side note or whatever, but I know that they said to take out all of um, your non curricular or non-medical jobs in your application they said oh you really shouldn't put any of that in there well at, like a lot of the interviews that i've gotten they bring that up as a reference one guy sells cutco when he this one guy did a program director he was like i wanted to let you know that you're the most uh i've been looking forward to this interview over all the other ones today and that not, and i thought it was because of this podcast or some other reason no it was for that for a cut something that i almost deleted um, and somebody, I just decided to keep it in or, you know, I was also a bartender at Red Lobster. Everybody brings that up for some reason. They think that's hilarious or they also worked at a Red Lobster. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta sell yourself. Yeah. Uh, dude. Yeah. So, uh, I do have to ask one thing, um, because we were just talking about like that rank list and everything. And I remember you explained to me once like the algorithm or like how they rank the like you rank they because they're trying to put you with your number one but they also factor in the uh, the program's number one too right yeah. so mm -hmm. how does that how does that really work so uh to put it this way uh to put it quite simply is you make your rank list right program one through ten and then at everywhere you interviewed right that's what you rank every every program you interviewed at you have to rank them let's just say you interviewed at 10 and you rank one through 10 and all the programs you interviewed at they have to rank everyone they interviewed now to make this simple let's just say a program has 10 spots in that residency program right and so what they do is they will look at all the applicants and match all the applicants. Like, let's just say I put Texas Tech number one, right? They're number one on my list. I have to be one of in Texas Tech's top 10 to match there, mm -hmm. right? But if I was number 11 on Texas Tech's list and they take, they had 10 people ranked above me and all 10 put Tech number one. Then, yeah. then they move to my number two. Mm. So keep going down your list as the uh, applicant ranker. Uh, they keep going down your list until they find a program that you ranked, that you fall ranked high enough such that you take one of their residency spots. Mm. Yeah. So that's the, that's the thing that I even realized. And that's a, actually a kind of a complex game is yeah. let's say I rank Texas tech number one or yeah. number one, but they rank me low, yeah. but everybody else ranks me very high. Yeah. And, you know, but I put big university programs or whatever, number two, number three, and number four, yeah. the spots that are going to fill up. So does that mean that they will move past me and put other people in those spots of people that put that at one? And so then I'll the, keep dropping. So tentatively, let's just say you put Texas Tech number one, and then you put all these big name programs that really wanted you, but Texas Tech didn't want you, right? So you probably aren't going to match at Texas Tech, right? Let's just say mm. you don't because you don't fall into their top 10 positions. Yeah. So then they move to your number two program. And let's just say that program has all of its spots filled right? Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden you didn't match at your number one. So they go to your number two and your number two is Georgia. And Georgia already has their 10 spots filled, but their 10th applicant was applicant number 21. And you were applicant 20. Mm. You know what happens to the list? They put him in? They shuffle him down to 11. 
Oh, okay. And they put you in the tenth spot. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah, but if he that's even if he puts him at number one, just because they rank me higher. Just because they ranked you higher. So he might have oh, okay. he might have put them at number one. Right? Mm -hmm. He might have put them at number one. And you put them in number two. But they put him at 21 in the rank list, and you were 20. Because you were one ahead of him, he gets shuffled down to 11. So you tentatively match, right? Oh, uh, okay, okay. Until it's finalized. Until the, yeah, until the next person that comes along that is number three and they're 19. Exactly. And so now uh -huh. you're number 10, right? You're mm -hmm. number 10, but then there's another guy who, uh, matched at Georgia, but it was his third spot, but Georgia ranked him four. He's going to shuffle you down. So now the original guy's at 12. You're at 11. He's at 10. And they take ah, away. okay. See, that's the complex part that I complex. never factored in. Yeah. That at least gives me a little hope because at one, at one point I thought it was all, you know, number ones. And then you never, you're, you're like, well, if I don't pick the right spot the first time, I'm going to be ending up at eight. No, 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 no. So that's yeah, good. A lot of people, you know, very few people make it past their top three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it is this way, you know, and, and yeah. a lot of people have this big misconception. And because it's such an individualized process, we tend to think, oh, I have to match there. I have to be, you know, I put them number one, they put me number one, right? And we have to met, but no, really, you know, some programs have as much as 10, 12, 15 um, residents a year. You just have to be ranked in their top 50. And chances are, if you put them one, because you got to think, not all the people they put in front of you, if you're applicant number 50, are going to put that program number one. So let's, yeah. just, let's just say every fourth person puts Georgia number one, right? And your applicant 50 on their rank list. So that means they're whoever's fourth, eighth, 12th, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, oh, right? You might fall in their top 15 still. Got so you, got cool. you, got you. Okay, so it might actually, so is it better then to... Let's say you got a program that only put takes six people. Is it yeah. better to put them at one and then put that bigger program at that takes 15? Is it better to put the smaller program at one and the bigger program at two because you may have a chance to shuffle somebody down? Strategically, yes. Strategically, okay. yes. Until you match on the smaller program that you didn't yeah. really <laughs> Smaller program, and that's not where you would have been the happiest. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So just take what you want, you know, don't, don't, don't make a move expecting a shuffle, right? Cause then you might get stuck somewhere you don't want to be like really just rank them where you want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And know that the chances of you being in the top 10 in your first three, you're going to get one of your first three. Yeah. It makes me nervous. Cause I'm like, I don't even know how many people these guys are interviewing too. Cause they, oh you know, I mean, they interview like, uh, I don't know, one person was talking about like 400 people. I was like, whoa, I don't know if that was a lofted number at me. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big number. I was like, geez, dude. One said it was only like 150, but. 150 to 200, I would say is the average. About 200. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, you got to take out time of your day. Um, I'm glad you said that because I've talked to a lot of people and I knew you had told me the whole system once. And then I was like, oh, yeah. And I would like tell them a little, a little bit, but then I couldn't figure out the rest. And I was like, and then I would ask somebody else. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody knows how the algorithm works, really. So that so that, that I'm glad that uh, we actually have this down so that people can actually, you know, because that's how you want. You want to know what you're going into and how the game is played. That's what you taught me that about the test, dude. You got to know how the game's played. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what was I know you were choosing Lubbock as your number one because you know you got ties to the place you love the program from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then like how else did you what else did you consider when you were making your rank list so oh man i considered my happiness right so i've been in baltimore i've been in california i've been to new york plenty of times and i was like you know i don't want any of those cities i don't like you know i like my wide open space i like being at work in five ten minutes everything is a 10 minute drive and so i wanted this the middle you know mid west of the mississippi and east of new mexico okay that little window and that is where I like, that's a window <laughs> and so if you were there i took that into consideration I took, you know, the size of the city, uh, it's obviously Southern better, you know, over Northern just because of the winters and family. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. exactly. And so, you know, I really ranked, uh, the program down in LSU was my number two, was my number two spot just because mm. my brother works in Louisiana. So he'd have been an hour away. Uh, the weather would have been nice. SEC football would have been nice. I tried to think about what I like to do when I'm not working and mm -hmm. whichever you know, and really, it was between my first two spots, man. And actually, my 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 top three choices that didn't get matched with me, uh, they all reach out and they were like, "Hey, uh, we ranked you really high on our list. Let us know what we did or could have done better," which mm -hmm. lets you know they ranked you to match. Okay, I mean? that's awesome. Yeah, do are you allowed to have any like communication with the programs like? explaining their rank list before the match happens some programs you know that's how they get sloppy they get a little messy uh and they actually have to be very careful because if they give you insight as you know let's just say they they say something that you interpret as oh i'm gonna match there and you move there in anticipation well they can turn around and say hey you told me this and you told me that and then you know it becomes a legal thing it can get ugly so Ooh. programs who very rarely mention anything with regards to their uh, intention on ranking. Mm -hmm. But you'll always get an idea that if you rank them, you're high enough to match. Got you. Yeah, they, uh, I've definitely got the whole, the whole spiel that is, oh, we can't really say anything right now. But what we can tell you is that if you ranked us, you would be very, you'd probably live happily down here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, those are the programs that you're in their top 50, you know, and like it's not about being in their number one. You can't think about it that way or else it's going to cause anxiety. You're yeah. in their top 50. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's good. That's a good way to think about it, because I'm always like I I'm, you know, when they do the pickup basketball and <laughs> I'm saying I'm a guy beside a guy that's six, eight can dunk. And I'm still thinking that I deserve to be the first pick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. this way. Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr was that uh, was on you know the '96 Bulls, baby. Yeah, getting headbutted by Michael Jordan. He got a ring, man. He got a ring. It don't matter. You don't. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're the last one, if you're position one or position ten. Mm -hmm. It don't yeah. matter. He might not be the most infamous bull from that team, but he's certainly up there in the top five now. Exactly. And I really just wanted to ask you one more question, especially on the um, the interview trail and everything. Uh, what? Sorry. We're going to have to cut some of that. All right, everybody. <laughs> We're back with Dr. Dr. Davalos. Um, so when you were interviewing, because that's what I'm going to selfishly ask, uh, uh, my question since that's what i'm going through right now um were there any tips because looking back on it you probably have more insight than when you're going right through it so uh do you have any tips uh for like interviews and like when you meet that program director i'll give you a prompt like when you're meeting that program director and you've only got that 15 minute session while all the other ones are 30 how do you handle it and how do you go in there ready to secure that spot you know the easiest way to go about it is pretend he is you know i'm sure you have a professor or a teacher or somebody who you kind of shot the, shot the shit with you see what i mean and pretend you got to think these people are human these people come home and have a beer 
and these people watch football and these people, you know, crack funny jokes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and they might they might talk a little shit to their friends. So you have to realize these people are humans. They're just at work. Right. And people at work like a relaxed environment. No one likes being uptight. So going into it, knowing that you can be yourself and who you're going to be when you work there, you're not going to be yes, sir. No, sir. No, ma'am. You know, to mm. a degree, be respectful, but make sure you can see that you're make sure they can see you're relaxed. Right. Yeah. You go in ready with something to knock them on their, on, on their heels, you know? So for instance, one thing I would always do when I would get to this program director or, you know, assistant program directors is one of the things I would ask is, so in my five, six year plan, I have two things right now. I plan ahead. One of them is complete your residency program to match in this fellowship. I was like, what is your five-year plan? Where are you going to be in five years when I need you to write me a letter of recommendation? Like, mm-hmm. what, is, what is the five-year goal of your APD? Are you worried they're going to gun for your spot? Or you think they're complacent and then you go meet with the APD and you're like you better go for his spot <laughs> and then, and then, you know, and then you, you know you get him thinking about stuff like am I doing enough or am I getting done down you know what I mean it's like huh. it's a, then, it flips the switch on the interview too it's the switch because now they have to be like I have to seem ambitious I have to seem you know it's like what 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 direction is like, what are you working on right now to improve your program, you know, or am I going to be and have the same education that, you know, the last five, 10 years of graduates have got? Like, where's mm-hmm. the innovation? What are you doing to innovate the program and make me a better doctor tomorrow? Yeah. Things yeah. That that's happen. a good way. Um, were you going to say something else? No. Yeah. Just things oh. that, things that, you know, instead of you trying to come out as I'm this, I'm that. You flip it on them all of a sudden, you know, and then yeah. they have the, they have to come up with something on the spot. Yeah, now they're interviewing you, or you're when interviewing they, them. When they grin, when they grin before answering the question, they're like, "Then you know, you know, you got them." Yeah, yeah. I uh, I've actually tried a little bit of that myself. Now uh, you're a better manifester than me, so. Uh, I, um, haven't done that necessarily, but I have to actually ask the whole five-year plan thing. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, or, or just asking like a personal question, something like that, that, you know, where they go, oh, that's a really good question. Um, and then they have to, you know, cause then uh, instead of them just asking you their questions and then, then they're like, okay, can you ask any questions? And then you're like, oh, where do you see? Or, or you're like, what is special about your program? You know, I bet they get that every time. Yeah. Um, and so I try to mix it up from there. Yeah, put them on, you know, put them on their heels and be kind of rememberable in that. I, I try to make people laugh. That's probably not the best way to go about it, but that's kind of how I am in almost all of my conversations anyway. So if that's how um, you are. And that's the best way you should be in the interview, to be honest. And that's how you're going to ensure you go to the spot you're going to be happy at. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That uh cuz um yeah, it's definitely it's a little nerve-wracking when it's coming up, you know, like you've got that first slot, they got all their energy, they're ready. Oh, yeah. And then they just go, "All right, ask me a question." And then you're like, well, "I can ask like all the all the questions I have, you know, mm-hmm. I've been thinking about your program, but I really want to know what your and Sierra had me with this one. I've used this one most. What's your pet pee? What's your pet pee? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, then they go, oh, uh, I don't even know. And then they're like, I guess. But that uh, that opens the door. It makes you, a, um, makes you a real person, too. It makes you, you know. And, um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a great little tip right there. Um, I will say also, um, 
as someone that's just going through it right now, so I don't have the insight of being past it yet. But the ring light that you bestow that y'all bestowed on me, yes, uh, it came in handy. Yes, yeah, certainly. I see some of these people now without them, and I'm like, ah, son. It makes a difference, man. It I does. Have, unfortunately, don't have mine right now, so I'm having to use some natural lighting. Uh, yeah. I, I still use my ring light till this day, but uh, one of the senior, uh, one of the chief residents is applying to Durham fellowships and things of that nature, and so I let them borrow it, and uh, it's funny you bring that up. Just yesterday, they were like, the ring light? A game changer. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, dude. Yeah. You're the reason because I wouldn't have gotten it. I would have been stubborn. Mm -hmm. You know, luckily I have the mics from the podcast, but then they see, you know, they see the mic and they immediately think I'm here for business. And they're mm -hmm. like, okay, like, man, he came ready. And some people actually appreciate it. Some people, it's like a joke, you know, as we play around, but then I can bring up the, you know, run the podcast and stuff. But then, yeah, like you can, it's just obvious. And if you have crappy lighting too, where you've got like a shadow over your face, yeah, dude, yeah, it's just, you know, yeah, so yeah, you've been, so evidently you've been helping everybody else out too. I hope so, man. It's good stuff. Yeah, yeah it is. And at first I was like, nah, nah, you know, what? A, and hey, I'll tell you, that is, that was a, a pro tip. That yeah. I did not think. I thought that was for just my little sister when she does her TikTok videos. But <laughs> that's, whoa. Um, so well, now that you are officially Dr. Davalos uh, mm -hmm. and you've got you've got your family so close, do they just call you with every uh, with any ailments or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Everybody, man. Everybody. <laughs> They're like, hey. I have this, I have that. Can you send something in, you know? Mm. All right, sure. I'm I'm bleeding a little in my poop. What do you think I should do? You have diabetes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <they're, laughs> you go you just go, I can already tell you I watch what you eat, you got diabetes. Mm. And he's like, That's not even what I'm asking. I just broke my arm. He goes, I I can promise you you got diabetes. I promise you you broke it because you probably have diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I will say, even just being in medical school, I walked into a party, like an old high, like it was some of the people from my hometown yeah. and they were like, oh, this, you know, this is Jordan. He is, uh, he's in medical school. He's about done. We're so proud of you, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, introduced me to like eight people at one time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, yeah. What's up everybody. And the guy, this one guy looks at me and he puts his arm, his hand on my shoulder. And he goes, I'm going to need to speak to you in a minute. And I was like, all right, whatever. And then he he said, he's like, I've been bleeding. I've been bleeding in my poop recently. What do you think I should do? I was like, see a doctor, dude. What are you doing? Eat less beets. I'm like, I'm not looking. I'm not looking at it for a stool sample right now, man. I was like, this is like a college game day. Right. Yeah, I was like, what is going on? That's funny. Yeah. No, they, do, man. they come out of everywhere, but it's all right. You know, honestly, that's those are some of the instances that make you feel. Uh, uh, really good you know just mm -hmm. you're not at the hospital so you don't have to go through the whole like stress of getting everything right you know it's somebody yeah. calling you for a quick little something and you get to feel that coolness of just sending something in it's yeah like, call me anytime <laughs> dude yes dude that i mean you've made it literally you've made it uh, so far you made it yeah it's a long yeah. road oh yeah you, you're you're to you're tiptoeing on the finish line right now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I the worst part though is uh some of my friends they have babies too. And so they'll send me like all these obscure rashes or they'll send me things and I'm like Yeah. I'm like I'm like going on up to date, you know, looking I'm like I don't even know what this thing is. You know. <laughs> Although, um, I, think, I think it's just normal. <laughs> rashes, man. It's like I'm not the pediatrician, baby. Oh. Uh, um well yeah man i uh i really appreciate this um you know i'll uh i know you've got um i know you got a busy schedule and everything oh I, there is one question though is huh? there anything that you miss from grenada now that we you've officially you're gone you've gone to baltimore you've gone to california back in texas 
Oh, there's a few things, man. Honestly, just the sunlight, man, the, the scooter rides to where we would all meet up to watch football games over by a Cuban corner. Ah, uh, yeah. Stags, you know. Just honestly, it just the place as a whole, right? The food, I don't know. If, oh, oh, the flan, the flan from the lady of at Cuban Corner. I was about to say the mofongo. The mofongo, the flan, the flan, man. I'm telling you, just the other day, I was looking up recipes for flan, trying to see like which one looked like the one she would make. <sighs> yeah, that's that's for real. And then like that's the, the Cuban Corner. Yes, and the days are uh, are uh, um, grand dance days. I really miss those. Mm. Those, oh, were, yeah. those were fun, man. After a test, yeah. They, uh, I had an interview with somebody uh, last week, and the guy was like, you know, he one of the senior residents was um, he went to St. George's, and so me and him for just a hot minute in the meet and greet were just had because he asked me, you know, are you a bananas or a brew guy? And then we just started chopping up. He was like, have you ever been to Cuban Corner, though? And I was like, oh, do you even know? Like, that was like one of our first stops. And that was one of our last. I mean, we went there all the time. And so, yeah, yeah, I, that's one thing I miss, too, is like the hangouts. Like we would I mean, yeah, we were studying all the time. But then there were those decompression sessions. And even not when we were just like studying stuff like that. Uh, we had like a, a solid group there. Somebody. Uh, Cause I was interviewing a program that didn't have any IMGs. And so I don't think they had, uh, I don't, and the guys, the guy didn't know anything about Grenada really. He yeah. was like, why, you know, I, I see that, you know, you went there. He's like, do you think that that was like a good experience and stuff? I was like, man, it like, there's some, there's some good things or there's some bad things. Certainly. Um, but I was like the people that I met and the times that I had, I wouldn't trade that for the world. Yeah. I, would do, I would do it again yeah that's what i was that's what i was like you know that's the path that i chose but i'd certainly do it again i was like watching football at the at the pita palace or palace. yeah or, maybe we, or, or even we when we broke into the uh the room at the top the of the room. building yeah i don't know what that room yeah, yeah that whatever a huge stream but we, we didn't miss a game up there yeah we like had to we weren't even supposed to be there so we would roll the tv to block the door yeah. uh and then yeah or block where they couldn't see us inside. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I learned how to make salsa. I wouldn't trade that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we played the Grenadian national team, like just all the experiences oh, yeah. you look back on. And it's just like, you know, we played the Grenadian national team to a buzzer, like to a last second shot. Yeah. Hey, man. Yeah. Dude, it is. Uh, I mean, we had some good times, man. And that, uh, and for that, wouldn't trade that for the world. Um, I know you're busy, though. This man's got a life outside of medicine, so he can't talk to us forever. <laughs> but we, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm sure everybody else appreciates all the wisdom, too. So thank you, Jesus. You the man. Always, man. I'm happy to be here. Glad I could help. And if you think of ever any more questions, um, just holler at me. Yeah. And if you want to reach him, you got to go through me, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, hit us up. Um, you can email us at offwhitecoatpodcast at gmail.com. Look us up on Instagram, Off White Coat Podcast. We got TikTok. We got Facebook. Hit, we got now. We now got a YouTube. So you can find this, the whole video on YouTube if you're just listening. This man's got a sexy ass little cowboy hat on. It's Yellowstone edition. Dude, you look like the guy from Yellowstone, the guy, uh, <laughs> with the thick beard you yeah. know what i'm talking about i haven't yeah. really seen it but i know my family watches it every time i think it's like every sunday or something um they watch it every time you don't have to watch it dude you look like that guy if i could pull him up uh you're like a hispanic whatever that guy is uh yeah. dude but we appreciate you coming on you're the man i do love Thank being you, here. all right everybody we out